Namaste. So this is the final section of the fourth Adhikarna. Actually, it's not the end of the fourth Adhikarna, but after this, the discussion veers towards a refutation of the Prabhakaras, which is a sect that died out centuries ago and has very little relevance to our discussion of these topics today. So this is related to the previous discussion on the false liberation or the incorrect concepts of liberation based on action. Liberation is not a matter of action. Action, such as puja, sadhana, mantra, and so on, is only to purify the living entity of the false upadis, the overlays, the superimpositions, such as the mind, the body, desires, possessions, identifications, attachments, and so on, all the junk that we've accumulated through many, many lives in this material world. So the opponent brings up an objection to this, and then Shankara elaborately refutes it, and that will be uh, the close of our coverage of the fourth Adhikarana. Opponent, is it not a matter of experience that the embodied soul is purified by such activities occurring on the body as bath, rinsing of the mouth, wearing the sacrificial thread, etc.? Vedantin, not so. It is the soul, cognized through ignorance, as constituting a factor in the assemblage of body, etc., that can be purified. For bath, rinsing of the mouth, etc., are directly perceived as associated with the body. It is reasonable that something associated with the body and cognized as the self through ignorance should be purified by the actions taking place on the body, just as that very entity gets the result of being cured, which is conjoined with the body, which identifies itself with the body, and on which arises the idea, I am cured, consequent on the establishment of the balance of the constituents of the body, phlegm, bile, and wind, through a treatment of the body, so also that entity is purified, to which occurs the idea, I am purified, as a result of such actions as bathing, rinsing the mouth, or wearing the sacrificial thread. And that entity certainly remains bound up with the body. For all actions are surely performed, and the fruits thereof enjoyed, by that entity which has the idea, I am the doer, stemming out of the idea of I, and which cognizes everything, as stated in the mantra, one of the two enjoys the fruits having various tastes, while the other looks on without enjoying. Mundakupanishad 3.1.1 As also the text, the wise people call that the enjoyer which is associated with body, organs, and mind. Katopanishad 1.3.4 So also there are the texts, the one deity remains hidden in all beings. He is all-pervasive, the indwelling self of all, the regulator of all actions, the support of all beings, the witness, consciousness, non-dual, and without qualities. Svetashvatarupanishad 6.11 And he is omnipresent, effulgent, without body, wound, and sinews, pure and untouched by sin. Ishvopanishad 8. These two mantras show that Brahman is beyond the imputation of all kinds of excellence or inferiority, and it is ever pure. Liberation is the state of identity with Brahman, and hence it is not to be achieved through purification. 
Besides, apart from these, nobody can show any other mode whereby liberation can be associated with action. Accordingly, apart from knowledge alone, there cannot be the slightest touch of action here. So, action is not the cause of liberation. Action can only affect the body and the mind. What we call the soul is the individual, and the individual, of course, is based on the ego. It is a function of the antakarana, the internal organ comprised of mind, memory, intelligence, reason, imagination, and so on. It is not real. It is part of maya. It is a dualistic entity subject to karma. Therefore, it cannot be the actual self. The self is forever without qualities, either good or bad, without actions, good or bad, and can never be the effect of anything. So, then, what is the use of all these processes given in the scriptures? And why are they praised as being part of the pathway to liberation? Because this false individual self, commonly called the soul, has to be purified. In other words, has to be done away with <laughs> in order to realize one's identity with Brahman. The self is nothing but Brahman, has always been and will always be nothing but Brahman. So there is no action, there is no process, there is no kind of sadhana or anything that can change the living entity, the soul, the individual, into the self. No. The self is already the self. And the soul, the individual, the ego, the mind, the intelligence, the body, etc., and all of their attributes are part of duality, maya, that which is not. Why do we say that it is not? Because it changes. It comes into existence at a certain point, persists for a while, and then dissolves and goes away never to be found again. This is the material existence. This is maya, the illusion. That which is only imagined and then superimposed on the substrate of the self, the reality. Just like the snake is superimposed on the rope. Just like the mirage is superimposed on the desert. So many examples are there. So we should understand that self-realization or enlightenment or moksha or liberation is never a product of any action. It is never the result of any work. It is not something that you can do because you, as the doer, do not really exist. And the proof of that is that we have to die. Death is the ultimate purifier because it destroys this illusory idea of I as an individual, as a doer, as one who acquires things, as one who possesses things or enjoys these things. That is all Maya. That is all nonsense. So what we have to do is learn the knowledge of Brahman, the Brahma Vidya. And although this is only words, these words point towards a certain experience. That is why when great teachers are teaching, they will raise the finger, the one finger. Huh? It means I am pointing at something beyond these words. These words are only an indicator. They are not the real thing, but they only get you to look at the real thing. And the example is given 
let's say um, one is to point out the star Mizar in the Big Dipper. Well, Mizar is a very small star. It's the companion star of Albion, the second star from the tip of the handle of the Dipper. And so it's very difficult for people to see. But if one, first of all, uses a pointer and says, okay, there is a tree, and on the tree there is a branch, and toward the end of the branch you will see the handle of the dipper or the great bear or whatever it's called in your particular culture. And the second star in from the tip of that handle has a tiny companion. And so if you squint real hard on a beautiful, dark, clear night, you can just barely see it. So by pointing out step by step, here's the tree, here's the branch, here's the handle of the dipper, here's the second star, and here's its tiny companion, one can actually realize or observe that which is very difficult to see. The same is true of the self, of Brahman. Actually, Brahman cannot be seen. It is the seer. But the point is that the instructions of the Upanishads point out how to realize that Brahman, how to realize the self, how to realize Hung Brahmasmi, I am nothing but Brahman. I am pure awareness of awareness. That is the self. Not this mind, body, ego, memories, imaginations, ideas, all this stuff, including language and culture and religion and everything invented by man is simply part of maya. That's why the religions change from time to time. Depending on the moral and intellectual and even material situation of the people, different religions arise from time to time by the will of the Lord to point out indirectly, step by step, this path that leads to liberation. But the final end of this path is not an action. It is not something you can do. Rather, you as the individual, as I, as the ego, has to be erased, has to be done away with. And when you see that, when you come to the realization that, oh, actually this I, this ego, does not exist. It is sheer imagination. That is the actual goal of the path. That is self-realization. That is enlightenment. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.